Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Anchored in the Word. And uh, this is our morning reflection. We're looking at Colossians chapter 3. And the verses we'll look at are verses 12 through 17. Again, I want to welcome you to our study on Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. If you have a Bible, uh, go ahead and take it. And I'm going to go ahead and begin reading. The scriptures say, Put on, therefore, <clears throat> as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, be ye thankful, and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in psalms and in hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Now when I read this passage of scripture, it's really one of, uh, I think, the most practical passages of scripture that we find in our Bibles. And so I wanted to go ahead and, and really dig into this this morning and begin with this summary statement. The following section of Paul's letter further developed the kinds of attitudes and responses that we as Christians are to put on in the place of the fleshly attitudes and responses that we have in our interpersonal relationships. And so really last time we looked at uh, the, the, the book of Colossians, we saw a very theologically rich passage where Paul's talking about the fact that because we've been placed into Christ and we're identified with his death and his resurrection, we have died with him and we are raised to walk in newness of life. And the old man has been replaced with the new man that is growing into Christ's likeness. And so Paul basically gives us theological explanation for how we can overcome temptation and how fleshly passions and practices can be replaced. And so he basically says, put off the old and put on the new. Well, Colossians 3, 12 through 17 is going to be a further development of that theological concept. But now Paul is going to take what is a theological concept and he's going to develop it with practical ways that we are to put this, in, uh, put in this into use in our daily lives. And really, this is a great time considering the fact that we are spending a lot more time at home with our families uh, a lot of people are having to work from home. The truth is that we are in a position right now where we are probably having to work out these practical concepts a lot more than usual. And so let's look at some of the details of how Paul says we are to replace fleshly attitudes and responses with godly, Christ-centered, spirit-filled responses. The first observation that I have in this passage is that we're to put on these attitudes and responses because of who we are in Christ. You know, Paul always starts with the theological reason for why before he gets into the what. That's a very common way that he deals with issues. And so let's look at how he deals with this issue. The first phrase that we see in the verse is in verse 12 is this. He says, put on therefore. In other words, on the basis of the things that I'm about to tell you, that's why and that's how you're able to do what you need to do here. He then says, as the elect of God, he, he reminds them that, that God has chosen them to this position. God has placed them into the body of Christ. We are in a special place because of the work of God on our behalf. And so he says, on the basis of the fact that God has worked in you, you are his elect, his people. He then goes on to say, as the elect who are holy, and that word holy has the idea of your saints. In other words, you're set apart for God's purposes. And then he uses the term beloved. He says that God has a tremendous love for you. He set his affections on you. So Paul begins with their position in Christ, the fact that they're his elect, the fact that they're set apart, the fact that God has set his love upon them as the basis for why these attitudes and responses should be a part of their life. The second observation that stands out is in verses 12 through 14. We're to develop deep, heartfelt, loving attitudes towards one another in our interpersonal relationships. 
Notice the words and phrases that he uses. In verse 12, he says, we're to put on bowels of mercies. And another way to, to put that is you're to have deep, heartfelt compassion for the people around you. When he talks about bowels, he's saying there's this internal sense of mercy towards the people around us. He mentions kindness and, and the way that we are to relate to one another is, is to be gentle and to be kind. He talks about humbleness of mind. We're to look at others ahead of ourselves. We're to put ourselves below other people and put their interests before our own interests and our interpersonal relationships where we don't think too highly of ourselves. He mentions meekness. The idea is that rather than fighting for my rights and demanding that everything be done my way, uh, I release my rights and I'm, I'm gentle and I'm kind and I'm I'm willing to let God fight my battles for me on these interpersonal uh, spats that we might have with people. He talks about being long-suffering in verse 12. The idea is that I'm going to bear under the load. And, and sometimes interpersonal relationships can wear us down. And sometimes the way that people respond to us, their, their reactions to the things that we say or do, and the back and forth can become very difficult. We're to be patient with people, bear long under those loads that we may have. And then in verse 14, he says, above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And the idea is that the, the highest quality of spiritual maturity in, in, in this path, according to this passage, is a genuine love for the people around us. If, if a person is spiritually mature, they're going to have a heart that's full of compassion. They're going to be kind. They're going to be loving. They're going to be merciful. They're going to be patient with people. Their lives are going to be Christ-centered and loving towards the people around them. We then come to a third observation. We're to respond with patience and a willingness to forgive those who've wronged us. In verse 13, he says, forbearing with one another. The idea is that, that many times before a conflict is resolved with people, there will be a, a period of time, a season, where people aren't acting right towards one another. And what generally happens is people withdraw themselves, and during that time of withdrawal, then, then the contention becomes greater and deeper, and the opportunity for it to be resolved becomes less and less likely. And what Paul says is that rather than withdrawing yourself from people, pulling away from them, and allowing those walls or barriers to go up, be patient with them forbear, bear under that burden. Let the, con the, the, the conflict just hold back where you don't go back and forth. And then he says, eventually, when the conflict is going to be resolved, you need to forgive one another. Verse 13, he says, forgive one another. If any have a quarrel against any, you need to forgive. One of the, one of the most important qualities that we have as Christians is that we're willing to be patient with the people around us because we love them. And we're willing to forgive them when they come to us and want to restore relationship. We then go to a fourth observation. We're to make the way uh, that Christ has dealt with us the ultimate pattern that we follow in our interpersonal relationships. You know, it's interesting. In verse 12, he emphasizes the fact that we are God's elect. We are set apart unto God. And he loves us deeply. Now, he's going to say later on in verses uh, 15, in verse number 15, that the way that Christ has dealt with us is not only uh, telling us about our position in Christ, but it's also the basis of the pattern that we're to follow. He says, as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. In other words, one of the reasons that people don't forgive other people, and one of the reasons that we're quick to cut people off and put up the barriers and separate ourselves from others, one of the reasons for that is that we don't think enough about how much God has dealt with us. In other words, when God pursued us, we were not pursuing him. When, when Christ went to that cross, we were the enemies of God. And so God has dealt with us with tremendous restraint, tremendous love. Uh, his forgiveness is, is overwhelming to, to, to think about. And so he says, when you deal with other people, you've got to let the way Christ dealt with you be the ultimate pattern you follow. He then says in verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And that, that, that word rule is, it, it kind of has the idea of an umpire. Like an umpire calls balls and strikes based on 
what the rule book says is a ball or a strike. And so what he sees becomes what he states. And basically what he's saying is when it, when it comes to your interaction with other people, the peace of God, what he established between you and him, you are his enemy, he reconciled you to himself through the death of his son, and now you're his child, now he is in relationship with you, that is supposed to call how you respond to people. In other words, that's the rule book, that's the standard, and how we relate to each other has to be connected to that. I then see a fifth observation. These attitudes and responses really are pointless without there being a connection to people where these attitude and responses have an opportunity to be practically applied. Verse 15, he says, to which you're called into one body and be thankful. Notice that he's emphasizing that these qualities and these responses are going to happen within a community relationship. In other words, it's in your families that these spiritual realities are going to be able to be practically applied. It's within the local church context. It's within your workplace. It's where you rub shoulders with people. You know, a godly person doesn't withdraw from people. He actually is willing to connect and interact with people because it's in that context that we're able to actually practically apply the truths that we have laid out in this text. And the last observation I want to mention is this. We're to have a Christ-centered life that flows from a Scripture-saturated heart. He then says in verses 16 and 17, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That, that phrase is a really, really interesting phrase. And what's interesting about it is it's very uh, closely connected to a statement that Paul makes in Ephesians where he says that we're not to be drunk with wine or in his excess, but we're to be filled with the Spirit. So in the same way that we're filled with the Spirit, we let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. In other words, it's not just something that we read. It's not just something that we think about occasionally. It's not just something that we meditate on. It goes even deeper than those things. It becomes a part of us. It dwells within us. It takes up resident. It actually saturates our mind and our heart where what the scriptures say becomes really the ultimate source for what we think and how we respond and how we feel about things. The word of Christ is to dwell in us richly in all wisdom. And then he mentions some of the responses that flow out of that. Teaching and admonishing in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And so the heart that is saturated with God's word is a heart that wants to express what it's thinking about and what really is becoming a part of it. And he's saying you're expressing what you say and you're expressing it in song. God's people should be a singing people. God's people should be a people that discuss the Bible because it's a part of their life. It begins to flow out in worship and flow out in a desire to express these wonderful truths. So how do we practically apply these things this morning? Well, let me give you a few thoughts that I jotted down and that I'm going to think about this morning. I encourage you to think about. First of all, theological concepts are not meant to simply be discussed. They're meant to be lived out. God wants us to be practical. He wants us to use our hands, not just our heads when it comes to the Christian walk. Two, I need to think deeply about how much God has done for me through the gospel. One of the reasons that we don't love people as we ought, that we don't forgive as often as we should, that we don't have that heartfelt compassion and that mercy towards other people, is it's because we don't think enough about how much God has done for us. When we think about the gospel and we think about ourselves in relation to God and how he's dealt with us, it really impacts how we deal with other people. Third, God wants us to live in community where we can grow in and live out our faith in Christ. God wants us not to withdraw from other people, but he wants our lives to rub with their lives. And I know we live in a social distance season right now where we can't meet together for church, but we're living at home with with our families. And because we're spending so much time with our families, that communal relationship really is going to either allow us to develop deeper richer relationship or it's going to create tremendous contentions and god wants us to be people whose hearts are saturated with his word 
so that those relationships become deep and become rich and we begin to mature and grow and develop and live out our faith. And lastly, God's word has to be saturating our lives. I need to read it. I need to meditate on it. I need to sing about the truths that we read about in scripture. And I need to talk about it with other people. I hope that there are people in your life that you have the kind of relationship that it's natural, it's normal to talk about God's word, to talk about the truths that you're learning about, to talk about the things that you're thinking about and how it's affecting your heart. These are the practical ways that we can live out this passage of scripture. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. And if you uh, missed the earlier part of this uh, lesson, I hope that you'll be able to go back. And this is a really rich passage. This is practical. And uh, I think it'll really be a help to us this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much for the time that we could spend in your word today. Help the word of Christ to dwell in us richly in all wisdom. May we be a people whose lives are living out uh, from a source of your word. Help us to be people who love you and love the people around us, who are living in the light of the gospel. May you empower us today to practically live out our Christian faith. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, so good to see you this morning. Thank you for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Praying that you have a wonderful day in the Lord. Bye now.